So thanks everyone for joining us on today's webinar about uh, proven sales and marketing techniques for expanding your e-commerce client base. My name is Jeffrey and I'm the head of marketing at A2X and I'm joined by Elish McCann, who's the digital comms senior manager at Method. And we'll be guiding you through this topic today. Before we get started, um, probably helpful for us to provide a little bit of context around our background as it relates to marketing and as it relates to the cloud accounting industry. So Elish, I'll, I'll let you get started here. Yeah, for sure. So um, for me, I've got about five years under my belt in terms of digital marketing experience. Uh, most of that's going to be on the SEO and the content marketing side of things. I've been at Method for almost uh, like four-ish years now. Nice. Um, yeah, hitting that three and a half mark soon. Very exciting. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Method, uh, we specialize in working with growing businesses that are using QuickBooks and Xero. Um, so I'm sure many of you guys have clients um, that are using either of those tools. Um, and we also do have some solutions for our accounting folks, um, since you guys are typically a champion user for us. Um, so yeah, awesome. so that's me. I'll pass it over to Jeff. Great. And my name is Jeff. Uh, I've been doing B2B uh, software marketing for the better part of a decade. Uh, and specifically, I've been working uh, in the cloud accounting space for over six years. Um, first, I was the head of marketing at HubDoc, uh, which is a company that uh, I'm sure many in the audience are aware of. Uh, and then I was the head of product marketing at Xero um, post-acquisition to now head of marketing at A2X, where I work with um, accountants and bookkeepers servicing the e-commerce industry on a daily basis. We have a lot of content to cover today. So um, you might see another face uh, in the Zoom panelist, and uh, that is Philippa. She will be fielding any and all questions that come through. And if you see her camera pop on, it tends to mean that she'll have a, a question from the audience. So please feel free to ask your questions throughout the webinar and we'll try to address them as, as best as possible in context. So let, let's let's get right into it. I think we have about 50 slides, so uh, hopefully we can make this within the hour plus Q&A. But we're going to get started by talking a little bit about why uh, e-commerce clients are in high demand and why we get this question uh, quite a bit, which is how do I acquire more of them? We're going to dive into probably one of the most important parts about your marketing uh, or in regards to your marketing, which is foundations, defining your target audience and unique value proposition. We're then gonna to try to demystify channel acquisition uh, strategy to reach audiences where they are. This tends to be one of the areas that can feel a little bit overwhelming. Uh, and then uh, Elish is gonna talk about marketing and sales process to increase conversion. We're gonna be using method as the example um, uh, from a CRM perspective, but if you're using a tool like HubSpot or any other CRM, uh, the same concepts will still apply. And as mentioned, Q&A, please ask your questions throughout the webinar. In addition, as uh, registrants to this webinar, you'll get early access to a marketing and sales guide. So you'll see throughout uh, this content, um, some templates, um, some examples. These will all be available in the marketing guide, which we'll send as a follow-up to the webinar. We'll also send the recording um, and anything else that we discuss uh, within the next hour. And then kind of the last caveat before we really dive in is marketing is not one size fits all. It totally depends on your practice, your services, the clients um, that uh, you want to attract, the clients that you're currently servicing today, and what your objectives are. That said, we've built the deck and this presentation um, for all types of practices to get value, whether you're just getting started in the e-commerce niche or have a scaled practice within that segment. Okay, so the big question, why are e-commerce uh, clients in high demand? I think if I were to ask everyone that's registered for the webinar so far, if they believed that more or less people would be buying online within the next five years, I can almost guarantee that 100% of people will say more people will be buying online within the next five years. It is a vibrant, growing industry. Yes, it did go through a boom during the pandemic, and it's kind of returned back to a steady state of growth as of right now, but it is still growing significantly. Retail uh, e-commerce sales will surpass $6.5 trillion by 2024 and will represent uh, a fifth of all retail sales. And that is going to continue to grow over time. And as e-commerce continues to grow, so will demand for practices specializing in, the, in this industry. And it's really simple to understand why, because accounting for e-commerce is more complex than your traditional brick and mortar retailers. It requires more consistent support and demands higher service fees. 
Those reasons alone are why many people are trying to attract more e-commerce clients, but there's, but there's more to it. In addition um, to requiring more support and, uh, and higher service fees, they tend to be a, quite a tech savvy audience because they're obviously selling online. They're obsessed with automation. On a daily basis, uh, we speak with multi-million dollar sellers that have like three staff members and it's all because of tech and automation. So they kind of understand the world that cloud accountants are in every single day as they're automating the workflows and they're using technologies to be able to provide really high level of service to their clients. And last but not least, they really benefit from accounting expertise. We talked a little bit about that complexity in the previous slide. Accountants and bookkeepers are there to help demystify that complexity. We know of a lot of e-commerce businesses that try to do their own accounting and they tend to spend way too much time on it and not to get the results that they need, which is why they truly understand the value when they start to work with an accounting expert that can help them get uh, the financial information that they need to make great decisions for the business. So how can I attract more e-commerce clients? We're gonna get into the crux of, of this topic as of right now. So when we talk to practices that are um, looking to expand their services to this segment, one of, one of the things that we see happen time and time again is they get a little bit overwhelmed with all of the opportunities available to them from a marketing perspective, right? You can do blog posts, social media posts, optimize um, your website for organic search, maybe do some Google ads, um, get onto every single directory, uh, send out a newsletter, do podcasts, right? There's just so, so much available to you. And we actually see a lot of practices start to dabble in these areas and not get the ROI that, they, that they're looking for. And they're really spending a lot of time and feeling quite overwhelmed. And that totally makes sense because marketing tactics without a cohesive strategy tend to be a distraction. We're gonna talk about how to build a strategy so that you can bring in your marketing channels, your marketing mediums and your topics into context. So you're actually doing a lot less from a marketing perspective, but getting a lot more ROI. And really like, I think marketing can sometimes feel overwhelming but for me, I try to think about it in the simplest of terms. One is the most important one, which is what we're diving into right now. Clearly identifying who your target audience is and what your unique value proposition is for said audience and how you are uniquely positioned to provide them with the services that will help them achieve their goals or solve their pain. Next up is when, once you deeply know who your target audience is, just simply find out how they like to consume information the channels that they use and the topics that they care about. And once you get that information through conversation, through surveying, through interviews, you can then focus your strategy on the channels that they've mentioned, the mediums that they consume content through and the topics that they care about. If you don't know what channels, mediums uh, and topics mean, do not fret. I'm gonna get into the definitions a little bit early, uh, later in the presentation and provide some examples. But really, it's as simple as that. Just know who you're trying to sell to, understand why you're uniquely positioned to support them, and then just figure out, like in their day-to-day, -day, where are they spending their time consuming information? How are they finding services? And be there. Like that's, at the, in the simplest terms, that's, that's effectively how most businesses, even A2X, focus their marketing activities and marketing strategy. So narrowing your focus on the right audience, easy to say, a little bit harder to do. I'm gonna to try to provide you with a framework uh, to get to this outcome. So first and foremost, right? The, the big question that we've asked is how do I acquire more e-commerce clients? I would argue that e-commerce is too broad of an audience. You can't be everything to everyone. And what's really interesting about e-commerce and we'll just talk about it at a high level. Think about the channels that people sell through, whether it's Amazon, Shopify, eBay, or multi-channel. Amazon sellers, especially drop shippers, don't see themselves in the same world as Shopify merchants. Etsy creators don't necessarily see themselves as Amazon drop shippers. In fact, Amazon refers to the businesses selling through their marketplaces as sellers. Shopify refers to their customers as merchants, 
big commerce refers to their customers as, as brands. You're kind of getting an idea here, right? Like e-commerce as a broad concept is quite broad, but then when you start to get into each of the, the channels, there's a lot more nuance there. Nuance in terms of how they define themselves, nuance in terms of what they care about, nuance in terms of what they're selling. So like one of the first things that I think e-commerce accountants and bookkeepers or those that are trying to grow their e-commerce client base should think about is what are the channels that you not necessarily are an expert in, but have some level of comfortability in and start there. The next thing is, do you have a unique experience with a health and wellness brand or a fashion brand or any other sub-segment? If you look through your client base today, many of you who are looking to grow your e-commerce practices likely have at least a few e-commerce clients in your repertoire. Maybe trying to, to look through the themes that exist within that client base will help you uncover a lot of these questions. That also applies for e-commerce practices that have scaled and have you know, hundreds of e-commerce clients. Next up is, is another dimension that we can be looking at uh, uh, from a targeting perspective is what, what business model do you prefer? We talked about drop shipping. We talked about brands that are manufacturing their own products. We talked about creators on Etsy, right? The world of opportunity there and the nuances within them uh, are quite relevant. And then we can go into what stage are you targeting, startup, scale up, et cetera. Does revenue band or employee count matter? See, I, what, what I find interesting about revenue band is we've worked with a lot of practices that uh, are, are targeting um, seven-figure sellers, but we've also worked with practices that target six-figure sellers. And the reason why they target six-figure six sellers is you have individuals that are making five hundred dollars to $700,000 a year, and they're one employee um, and could really benefit from outsourced accounting and bookkeeping services and um, have the firepower to be able to afford your, your, your service fees. Another dimension is, can you support global organizations outside of your geo? Or are you specific to supporting folks in North America or in Europe or in Australia and New Zealand? And then the last question, I think, you know, regardless of what industry segment you're targeting, what type of e-commerce clients do you enjoy? What are maybe some personal characteristics? What's amazing is you can get to these answers pretty easily by simply reviewing your existing client base. And that's step one in narrowing your target audience. And I would go as far to say as narrow as much as possible right at the beginning, niche and niche again, because the more narrow you get, the more unique your offering becomes. We have one practice that we work with, uh, which is uh, Cindy from Bookskeep. And, you know, we've had multiple conversations and she specifically is supporting e-commerce businesses. She is an expert in profit first. And she has um, a desire to support, especially working moms, individuals that uh, are, are potentially transitioning off of mat leaves and, and uh, starting e-commerce businesses. And she really targets her messaging towards that specific audience, right? E-commerce businesses, profit first, working moms. If you are an individual that, was, that is within that segment, why would you not work with Cindy from Bookski? So that's kind of the idea. And the cool thing is, is when you start really narrow, you can then add on additional niches over time as you win your segments. The next piece is, is once you've kind of reviewed your client list, identified the characteristics that make up an ideal client, meeting your target audience to gather insights on effectively um, how you should go about into the market and acquire more of these types of businesses. So when you do meet with these individuals, I have some tips on what to ask to help you define your marketing strategy. First and foremost, firmographics, which are the characteristics that define these businesses, like industry, their target customers, employee count, revenue, location, tech stack. These might seem a little kind of boilerplate, but the reality is they can be quite valuable, especially if you do decide to do paid advertising in the future, because these inputs are typically the ones required to target your audiences. 
After you've gone through your firmographics, next up, and this is one of my favorite questions, considering the fact that you're likely interviewing people that are already clients, asking them how they completed their accounting before you and the reasons they decided to find a new solution. This tends to uncover quite a bit of pain points around their process, around the workflow, and also starts to give you an inkling as to the value that you provide them with. And then from there, understanding what was their trigger? What was this, the goal or the pain that had occurred where they were like, enough, I'm not gonna be doing this myself anymore, or I'm gonna look for somebody that's more specialized in e-commerce accounting, or I haven't done this before, but now I'm being told by my tax accountant that I need to get it in order. Understanding what's driving them to make a decision that they need to purchase outsourced accounting services or bookkeeping services is gonna help you identify the messaging um, that is required to meet people where they are when they're in buying mode. Also, it might also help uncover some um, channel opportunities. So for example, I, I mentioned folks that aren't doing their accounting today or maybe their books aren't in order. And you might notice that a few of your clients said, oh yeah, our, our tax accountant said, um, that I need to get my books in order and I need to work with an outsourced accountant or bookkeeper. If you hear that time and time again, that might be a trigger for you to maybe meet with that tax accountant or other tax accountants and build a referral partnership. And then next up is, okay, so once you understand your firmographics, once you understand how they did it before you and the pain that they experienced, and then the trigger that had occurred for them to start looking for your services, we wanna ask them why they decided to choose you. Why were you different? That is going to help you uncover your unique value proposition for that particular segment. Now, I'll jump into a few examples a little bit later. But getting, getting to the crux of that question, I think, is really valuable. Because not only do you now know what they used to do, you now know what they're doing with you and, they, and why they chose you and why they're continuing to work with you. And the last question, and this is going to be the one that will help you demystify your acquisition strategy. And it's a super simple question that a lot of people fail to ask before they start doing their marketing is how did they find you? Did they try anything else before working with you? On a day-to-day -day basis, where do they go to consume information around their business? Are they a part of Reddit subgroup, uh, subreddits? Are they a part of e-commerce communities like e-commerce fuel? Do they get their information from Twitter threads? Are they on LinkedIn? Do they do most of their research on YouTube? These are gonna be the nuggets that are gonna effectively give you a path in terms of what marketing areas you should really focus on. So after you've interviewed um, your clients, the next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is translate that into what's called an ideal customer profile. As I mentioned, we have the guide that we've put together. We will share it post webinar and it has a few of these templates in place. There are many templates uh, like this that exist externally. You might even already have some within your practice, uh, but I would highly recommend documenting this because not only is it a good reminder for you, but it's also a good reminder for your team as you go about building and executing your marketing strategy. Next up, unique value. So you've done these interviews, right? And you've, you've figured out your firmographics which effectively is, is likely going to be your niche or your target audience within e-commerce. And in this case, right, I'm going to give you an example. We've identified that it's a multi-channel merchant with a heavy lean towards Shopify. The category, the frame of reference that they use when thinking about us is e-commerce accountants and bookkeepers. It's always good to uh, list out your competition because not only are you going to understand your uniqueness based on the information that your clients are going to provide through the interview process, You'll also understand it um, if you do a little bit of competitive analysis. And then from there, you can start to document the unique value that you provide specifically to multi-channel merchants with a heavy lean towards Shopify. In this case, as an example, one of the unique attributes is this practice is a Shopify expert, but they're also comfortable with other e-commerce uh, channels, including Amazon, eBay, Etsy, Walmart. The value that businesses get from that unique difference is that Yes, I can provide a high level view of all of your e-commerce performance, but since you have a heavy lean towards Shopify, I could really drill down in that area and give you um, the, the financial performance results 
that you need to make good decisions. And who's going to care about that a lot? Likely Shopify merchants that are exploring new channels, but still focused on their Shopify business. Through the interview process, right? Like instead of having a website now that says, I am in an e-commerce accounting practice and I service e-commerce businesses. And these are all the channels that I support, which effectively speaks to everyone, but at the same time speaks to no one. You can now have significantly more targeted messaging where you're effectively communicating that, hey, yeah, I support multi-channel, but, but I'm re I really go deep into Shopify. So if you're a Shopify merchant and you're looking to, to explore new channels, I'm the practice for you because I can grow as you grow. And then from there, you can translate that into your value propositions and your messaging, the things that are going to live on your website. We're gonna share this template and, and more after the webinar, um, but effectively this is kind of just kind of when rubber hits the road, what are the words that you're gonna to use to communicate your value, your website, your social media posts, so on and so forth. The key though, is to understand what your unique value is in the first place for that very specific target audience. That's how you create messaging that resonates. It's not about being an incredible wordsmith. It's just about being really tight about who you serve, why you serve them, and how you're different. And the last piece of the equation is to bring it all together on your website. One thing that we've noticed, and this applies even for businesses that have dozens of e-commerce clients, they do not have an e-commerce landing page on their site. They, do, they don't even mention e-commerce, and yet they have a handful of e-commerce clients and they wanna grow their e-commerce client base. So it's really important, whether you're targeted towards e-commerce businesses and your whole website is targeted towards e-commerce businesses, for folks that are in that camp to get really tight on your messaging and your unique value proposition based on the research that you've done. And if you are a full service accounting practices for multiple industry uh, industries and e-commerce is a niche that you're now starting to explore and grow in, really important to have a landing page, a place that you can send people or a place that people can go to understand what your unique value is for their particular business type, as opposed to having kind of website that speaks more generally to every business type. I can go on a ton about landing pages and, and um, how best to format them and, and how best to write messaging. That could be a webinar on its own. We might even, if, if you want, you can reach out to me. We might even have follow-up discussions on this topic, uh, but, for now, I guess the point is have a place on your digital properties where people can go and understand what your unique value is for the segment that you support, which is e-commerce. Okay, so now that we have our foundation in place, like we know really well who our target audience is and we know really well how we can uh, uniquely support them. Next up is about creating a channel acquisition strategy to reach your target audience where they are. Where they are is critically important here because when I showed you this overwhelming view of all the things that you could do, it doesn't mean even if you did most of these, it doesn't mean that that's where, you're, that's where your audience is, right? Through the interviews, you'll have been able to pinpoint the channels and the mediums that your audience care about. And now you can start to focus your marketing efforts towards them. Now, just a, a few definitions for those that are unfamiliar with terms like channels and mediums. It's actually quite simple. I'm going to provide a few examples. Channels are effectively where you communicate your message and mediums are how you communicate your message. In practice, this means, as an example, a channel can be outbound sales, organic search, YouTube, email, social media, communities, Google ads, it's not the thing that you're sharing through these channels. This, the channel is just how you get to your audience. The thing that you share is the medium, whether that's blog posts, webinars, courses, templates, podcasts, case studies, newsletters. Your website kind of is a little bit in the middle because you're sharing information through the website, but it's also a place where people come. Um, but it tends to be the only ex exception. But what's really important when you're interviewing your customers and your clients to understand the channels that they go on to every day. Do they, do they log on to Facebook? Do they log on to Twitter? Are they kind of scrolling their Twitter feed on a day-to-day -day -day basis? And then the next piece that's important, what do, if they're on Twitter, what do they like better? Do they like better reading threads? Do they like the videos that are posted on there? Um, do they like it when it links out to a blog post? Right, like getting really deep 
into how they like to consume information and where they consume that information will really allow you to focus your efforts in the right areas. One example of this, just to go a little bit deeper, is um, if I'm interviewing uh, one of my clients and they say like, I consume all of my information through video, right? Like I have a question, I try to find the video to get me the answer whether it's about my e-commerce business, whether it's about my accounting or whether it's about my personal life. So you know that the medium that they care about is video. So you wanna be producing videos, right? But producing videos isn't enough. If a tree falls in the woods and nobody's there to hear it, doesn't make it sound, I'll leave you all up to debate that philosophical question. But the idea is, right? Like just doing a video, just doing a webinar, it's not enough. You then need to ask them the question, where do you consume your videos and your webinars? And then you'll get some great answers like, oh, I use YouTube. Like YouTube is my search platform. It's where I get all my information. Or I like watching, like when I'm on social media, I, I tend to stop scrolling when I see a video and watch the video versus reading a long post. Gives you kind of great insight into, okay, you, you like consuming your information in video. That's likely where I should spend most of my time. Should maybe stay away from blog posts and other things. And you consume your video, your, 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 your videos on YouTube. Great. Like right then and there, that's a marketing strategy to acquire new audiences that fit a similar profile to your existing audience. The important thing is though, is you want to try to identify themes, right? Like obviously one person is in a large enough sample size. So if you can try to interview as many people as possible, and you'll quickly identify themes in the areas in which you can focus your efforts. Next up, I think another helpful way to think about all of the channels at your disposal, as opposed to that, like, that big, confusing, overwhelming board, is to think about it in the context of an acquisition journey. And I've simplified the acquisition journey here into three steps. There's demand creation. This effectively means going out there and creating demand for people that aren't in market to buy today. So for example, in the context of my uh, Shopify merchant, um, who is also doing multi-channel, but has a heavy lean toward Shopify. How do I go about making that person aware that they need accurate accounting to run their business successfully and that they should be looking for accounting services? That is slightly different to demand capture. Demand capture assumes that that person already knows, they've hit that trigger point, and they're now in market looking to buy. On the demand capture side, the name of the game here is understand where they go to find services and solutions and be there. And then position your unique value on those channels so that they choose you versus everything else that's available. And then last but not least, conversion. Once you've done all of that hard work to create demand for people that aren't in market to buy today or to be present when people are ready to buy, how do you make sure that they have the best marketing and sales experience while they're in your pipeline? and achieve the highest likelihood of conversion into client. Different channels are better suited to different stages. So on the demand creation side, you could be using things like YouTube, events, paid social, organic social, organic search, right? Like, by the way, this isn't a plan. This, so, so don't take a screenshot of this. This is an example. <laughs> so you could be on the demand creation side uh, and you can say in that, in that video example that I'm gonna focus most of my efforts on social media and YouTube, right? Demand creation is about how do I go out there externally and reach my audience and make them aware that they have a problem and that they should likely be looking for a solution, which is my services. Demand capture is a little bit different than demand creation. Demand capture actually needs a broader approach because if people are looking for solutions, you want to be everywhere they're going to look because you want to be present and you want to be able to communicate your unique value proposition. So that's all the way from organic search. Organic search in this context means just having a website that's search optimized. And then you have a bunch of directories that are at your disposal, whether it's the zero directory, the A2X directory, which we'll get into in a little bit because it's especially suited towards e-commerce, the pro advisor directory. And then if, if you're struggling on the organic search side, there's always a fast track to being the first result when somebody searches on Google, which is a Google ad. And then even just LinkedIn in mail or accounting institutes that refer clients out to, to folks that are registered with those bodies. 
So here's where I would argue that you want a little bit more of a broad approach than a targeted approach. On the domain creation side, I would say a lot more targeted. On the conversion side, right, that's likely you already have the lead in your pipeline. So this is more about, you know, how do I nurture them using uh, email nurtures or email sequences? And then how do I bring them down my funnel or my pipeline or whatever terminology you want to use? to get them from a lead that's interested in, 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 in my services to a client that's paying for my services and, and happy with my services. So again, I'm, I'm just gonna kind of reiterate this because it's incredibly important, but we must remember that the channel mix will depend on where your audience likes to consume information, which you'll uncover when you meet, meet with them. It's that last question um, in that, in that slide where I showed you all the questions that I would, I would recommend asking. So let's dive into demand creation and uh, look at a few examples of practices uh, that have really focused their efforts on one or two of these channels to, to get as much ROI as possible. And what you'll see, again, as I mentioned, it's not about going broad on demand creation, it's actually about going deep. So it's not about the volume of channels that you have, but the focus and the consistency and picking the right topics that really, really matters here. So let's go through a few examples. Bean Ninjas um, is an, an e-commerce practice and they really understand the topics their audience care about and the channels and mediums they use. Uh, and that has evolved for them over time. I remember a few years ago, they were really, really into organic search. And the more they talk to their um, clients, the more they realize like, oh, our clients really like to, to consume podcasts. Not only do they like to consume podcasts and that's where they get their information. Many of our clients are a part of e-commerce uh, communities like e-commerce fuel is an example. Once they, once they learned that through their interviews, that's where they started to spend most of their time and their efforts. So Be Ninjas today has their own podcast, but Wayne also, is a guest on many e-commerce podcasts that target, target the same types of e-commerce sellers or seven-figure sellers that Bean Ninjas want to support. They're members of e-commerce fuel. And, uh, and really, I would say that it's, it's, been, it's been a strategy uh, that they've executed really well. And they're super focused. And again, with, with Bean Ninjas, the more they talk to their clients, the more their marketing strategy will evolve over time. But it's not about volume. It's about picking the right channels and picking the right topics and then just going with it. Another example, I love this example, which is Ledger Gurus. Um, they really understand that their audience specifically really cares about education. A lot of the clients that they have look to do it themselves in the first place and we're trying to educate themselves on how to do it. Um, and they saw that and they realized that YouTube and video for the channels and mediums that their audience really cared about. And they kind of went all in on YouTube. In fact, they are probably, I would argue, one of the best in, we're talking e-commerce here, but I would say just cloud accounting generally as it relates to video content production. They get more video views than most websites get traffic. Uh, and they have really great content and they've been consistent. Um, and uh, it is a channel that is really delivering for them. Accounts and legal. Um, so they have a budding uh, e-commerce practice, a budding se segment. So they're, they're more holistic. They service many different industries, but e-commerce is one of their uh, focus areas. And they found that LinkedIn posts and videos have been really, really effective in attracting their ideal customer profile. The reason that they've uncovered this is twofold. One is they talked to their clients and they got this information. And then they're also starting to see success with it. And, and it's forcing them to double down. They really focus in on this channel. And what's super interesting is notice how like, I, I just picked cherry pick three posts, but these three posts are from three different people. And uh, they feature three different uh, mediums. Like one is a video, one is a photo, one is a post only. And they're experimenting, but really like what they're focusing on for this channel is quality and consistency. That is the key, right? Like one post here and there is not gonna get you to the outcome that you want. It's really about getting everyone within your organization involved, picking the topics that your audiences care about and being really consistent and delivering high quality work product in the mediums they wanna consume their information in. 
Alvert e-commerce um, understands the topics their audience care about. And one of the channels that they use with great effect is events. So they go to e-commerce specific events where direct sellers show up and learn about e-commerce. And they use it as an opportunity to meet with their audience and then, and then position their services. This might look like it's the same event because there's a lot of blue, but they are different events, I promise you. Um, and they've, they've approached the strategy with great effect and they're continuing to do so. And as they learn more um, from their, their clients and their ideal customers, they're now starting to expand their reach um, as well from, from a marketing channel perspective. Okay, so I think that gives everyone kind of a really good view on what channels and mediums are. Let's talk a little bit about topic ideation. So topic ideation is, um, is a really important piece to the puzzle because even if you get the channel right, even if you get the medium slash content format right, if you're not talk, talking about the topics that your target audience care about, they're just gonna scroll through or they're, they're, they're not gonna read and, and or they're, they'll ignore it, right? So the idea here is you want to apply the same type of customer research to your thinking around topics. So as you survey your clients and staff, what keeps coming up? Like what are the themes and how can you contribute to that conversation? You could also do keyword research, which is a little bit more of a data-driven approach using free tools like Google Keyword Planner or Ubersuggest or the multitude of different tools. Um, Keyword research effectively, you can put in a keyword. So for example, um, e-commerce accountant servicing Shopify, and you'll be able to see the search volume over uh, a given period. And you can do that with any combination of keywords and get an understanding for what the demand for those topics or for those products looks like in the market. And then you can focus your efforts in those areas. Social monitoring, right? Like, when you're having a conversation with your clients and they're telling you, I consume my information on uh, Twitter and I follow these people, it would be great if you started to follow those individuals as well and started to identify the themes um, from a topic perspective and started to contribute to the conversation there. Evaluating the competition, less so around what they are doing and more so around like what are the gaps that you can fill. And then I think what's also interesting, we, we talked about events a little bit. You don't need to go to events to be able to find out what topics are getting traction at e-commerce events. Uh, so like you could do a quick search on Prosper as an example and look through all of the topics that people are talking about at Prosper. And if you know folks that have gone to Prosper, you can ask them what the most popular sessions are. And it'll really kind of give you insight into the topics that people care about. Uh, I, I like this one a lot because it's, it's one that's seldomly used, but provides a tremendous amount of value. And then lastly, what resources do you use in-house with your e-commerce clients? And uh, can they be repackaged and share with, with prospective clients? We do this all the time at A2X. For example, we have an e-commerce bookkeeping checklist. We have um, how to onboard e-commerce clients checklist. Um, these are documents that people use internally within their practices that they've actually shared externally with e-commerce businesses. And you might be asking yourself, am I sharing the secret sauce? If I share this information, um, will it be less likely for these folks to come and work with me? We found that it's actually quite the opposite. The people that are going to leverage these resources and not come to you for services likely weren't going to come to you for services anyways. But the people that do leverage these resources, as an example, an e-commerce bookkeeping checklist, what tends to happen is, oh man, that's a lot of work, but I, I like what I see and I'm likely gonna go to that practice who's provided me with this great value and ask for them to do it themselves. In fact, I have a personal anecdote here that, had, that happened to me today. Uh, I, have a, I have a wood stove oven in my basement and unfortunately a bird uh, fell through the chimney. So it was, it was stuck in the wood stove oven and I went online and I searched how to get a bird out of my wood stove oven. Uh, and I read through this thing and I was like, I don't, I don't wanna do any of that. So I, I, I called, um, I didn't call an exterminator, I called pest control and they came and they rescued the bird. And what's interesting is I called the pest control in my area that actually are the ones that provided the content on how to do it myself. So that's, that's how the two got connected. That was, my, that was my customer journey there. And we actually see that quite a bit when practices go out there and provide valuable resources on e-commerce accounting, specifically for potential clients. 
you tend to have people like me who are like, that's a lot of work. I don't want to do that. I want to work with an expert. And that's kind of, you, you give a little and then you, you get a lot, I guess, is the concept there. Again, similarly speaking to figuring out your niche, reviewing your client base, you likely already have a lot of these, a lot of these answers. I'm just going to reiterate this because it's incredibly important. It's not about volume of channels, but focus, consistency, and picking the right topics. If you can do that, this now this picture starts to get a lot clearer. On the demand creation side, you might have one or two channels, maybe three. Demand capture, however, you kind of, as I mentioned, you, you want to be a little bit more broad. Now, what's interesting is I, I looked at the list of attendees and registrations for this webinar, and I noticed that a lot of the people here are already present in most of these areas. Whether they're a pro advisor, they're already on the directory, or if they're a zero practice, they're already on the zero directory. A lot of them already have websites. Not everyone does Google ads, uh, but there's a lot of pre presence here. So given the amount of time that we have in the webinar, I thought I would focus on one key area, um, which is the A2X directory. So there are a lot of directories available for e-commerce accounting practices, but one of the directories that I would say uh, is the most valuable, I obviously biased, but the data also suggests that this is right as well, is that A2X is the number one e-commerce, uh, number one place where e-commerce businesses go to find an experienced e-commerce accountant or bookkeeper. And it's one of the benefits of partnering with A2X when you are a partner and you have to meet a, a, a few cr uh, criteria, which we'll share post webinar. But once you are a partner, you can get listed on the A2X directory and we work with tens of thousands of e-commerce businesses that don't have an account or bookkeeper that use our directory to find an account or bookkeeper to help them with ongoing services. In fact, many of our practices say that it's one of their largest channels for leads. I can give you um, Oliver Blackmore from Elver uh, who mentioned that they've had their biggest client ever come through the directory. And not only that, they have quite a bit of clients come through it. And, and we hear this time and time again from partners that are coming through the directory. So I'm not gonna to spend too much more time on that as a demand capture channel, but it is one, if you are not currently on the A2X directory, I would definitely consider exploring. And again, we will share more information in terms of what criteria you need to meet to be eligible. We will also share a partner directory report. As I mentioned, we have the data to suggest that it is likely one of the, the, the channels that provides the largest source of leads for our partners um, through our directory report, which will also be included in the follow-up. I can go into all of those other channels in demand capture and probably spend a whole session on them. Um, given the amount of time we have, we're at 145, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Elish so she can talk a little bit about conversion um, and uh, ensuring that you have technology in place uh, so that no lead fall through the cracks. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, that was such a great overview for our audience today on kind of where do you be, you know, applying focus in terms of marketing and what tactics to maybe be exploring. So um, once all of you have done all that hard work after this webinar, you've nailed down those channels and those mediums that you want to pursue. Um, I think the next question is, what do I actually do with these, you know, with these leads that I brought in, these potential buyers? Um, how do I turn them into paying customers and not only paying, but like lifelong, long-term customers? So the first step here is I want you to think about this before you get to the point that you have generated all this, um, all these leads, all this interest, right? Um, so what we see a lot of times is people start their marketing strategy and are feeling, you know, optimistic. They want to see what kind of trickles in. And when they actually start to get some success, they're like, what now? What do I do here? And so this is what we're going to talk about a little bit today. So my first kind of tip is to think about this when you are launching your marketing strategy. You want to have some sort of plan for once the interest in the leads start coming in. Um, when you are thinking about what do you want to happen after, you know, you've gotten some leads in, um, I want you to be thinking about building a repeatable and automated sales process. So if you are looking to grow your firm, um, grow your presence in e-commerce, um, you have to have some sort of plan and you want it to be repeatable so that as you grow, as you scale, um, you and your team can kind of keep up with this growth. Um, and automation is going to be your best friend here, right? So uh, you're not going to have time as you're growing to, you know, jump on the phone with every single lead that comes in and all those kind of things. So let's really leverage technology here um, to make sure that you can 
can't get a handle on everyone who's coming in. Um, so you might be thinking, how am I building this repeatable automated sales process? This sounds really intimidating. I am an accountant and that's my bread and butter. Um, so luckily technology is here to help you. Um, so a CRM is a really good tool to explore. And like Jeff mentioned earlier, you might be using Method, you might be using Salesforce or HubSpot or another kind of provider out there. Um, and kind of the why of why you should even explore this, this bucket of software um, is that as you scale, like you're not going to be able to keep up um, with having your leads or prospects in something like an Excel file or a Google Sheet. Um, at some point, you know, usually we see this around, you know, when you start getting to five plus employees, that's kind of the time that makes sense that a CRM is something that you are going to need to uh, manage the demand that's coming in and make sure that you're not leaving any opportunities opportunities on the table here. Um, so when you've gotten to kind of this point of scale, um, what you want to be thinking about is, you know, looking for a CRM that has defined workflows. Um, these are going to be kind of best in practice when it comes to your sales process, because uh, again, this technology does, um, you know, specialize in sales process, sales workflow automation, all those kind of things. So that's one thing that you're going to be looking for. Um, another huge benefit of kind of using a CRM is that you're getting visibility into the work that um, others are doing on your team. Um, so as you're growing, you are not going to be able to follow up with every client. You're going to be delegating that work. And that's a really important part of scale, right? So a CRM is going to give you, you know, that cloud access, that visibility into what your team is working on, into where roadblocks are happening, into where opportunities are maybe dropping off, all those kind of things that are going to help you, one, improve your sales workflow uh, in terms of what your team is doing, um, and then also close more deals at the end of the day, which is obviously a huge part of generating revenue and bringing that new business in. Um, so that's another plus. And then, of course, we've kind of talked about this a little bit already, but um, you're going to get a lot of you know, sales workflow automation here. So a lot of the highly repetitive, you know, non-critical thinking tasks that are part of your sales process that are, you know, a necessary part of moving leads from, um, I guess, down the funnel, if you will, from someone who's potentially interested and educated about accounting services to someone who's interested in actually working with you and is ready to, you know, put their credit card down and say, let's do this together and pay for your services. Um, so that's, <laughs> excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, so that's a little bit of a context of why CRM and how you can really um, get into building that automated repeatable sales process that's going to convert your leads essentially from just leads, potential customers into paying lifelong customers. Um, so now that you've got all your leads, um, you've kind of brought them in from different channels um, and you have kind of, I guess, taken them out of an Excel file, you hopefully brought them into some sort of CRM um, so that you can actually better activate them, better nurture them, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's a question of how are you going to really activate them? So a few recommendations here is when you do have your leads inputted into your CRM is you want to first start with, you know, segmenting your contacts in terms of tags. Um, you can do things like industries, um, all these different things. So you know, maybe what piece of content that they came in from, maybe you met them at an event. Um, these are kind of great things to kind of use to segment your leads, same with geography, all those different kind of firmographics that Jeff was talking about earlier. Um, you're going to want to segment these contacts because you should be um, speaking to them in kind of different ways, depending on where they are in the buying process. Um, that in your CRM tool, um, you're going to move into kind of the stage of things where you are creating a proposal, which is really exciting. You want to start engaging them with an actual engagement letter. Um, so this is somewhere that a uh, tool like Method, maybe you're using something like Ignition, maybe you're using some customized version of Salesforce um, to actually automate the process of creating these proposals, um, as well as your engagement letter. So kind of the benefits of this is that you are going to save yourself time, you're going to be able to allocate your your valuable time and your resources um, to things that are maybe a little more value add for your practice, um, which is obviously a plus. Beyond that, um, standardization is another thing. So uh, when you're using software to create your proposals and automating it, um, you can kind of bet that whether it's you creating their proposal um, for a potential e-commerce client or someone else on your team, uh, that there is going to be like a certain level of professionalism, um, that your branding is going to be consistent, that your uh, terms and conditions are going to be there, applied correctly, um, all that kind of stuff. 
And then beyond that, accuracy is another big one. So, uh, you know, if you're just going in and manually changing out, you know, a client's name, address, all that kind of stuff. Uh, obviously, it's a lot more prone to error, I would say, um, than if you are uh, doing that stuff without, you know, some sort of proposal uh, creation solution. Uh, so those are a few tips there. Um, beyond that, um, you're going to be able to uh, actually automate client communication, which I know is a big kind of, you know, not... It takes up a lot of your time. Let's just put it that way. Um, so you can automate that. You can automate your follow-up cadence, which can be really tough if you do have an interested lead, an interested buyer. Um, it can be tough. Maybe you did send out your proposal, um, an engagement letter to them, and you haven't heard back. So remembering to do those actual follow-ups, um, while tedious, um, is a really crucial part of oftentimes winning business. Um, so if you can use some sort of software, whether it's method or another tool, um, to automate that process, it's going to be really powerful. Um, and then same thing goes for actually like collecting payment, onboarding um, different clients as they come in. Automation is going to be uh, really key here. And that's something that method and a variety of other tools can kind of help you with um, to ensure that you are maximizing your conversion rate on those leads that you're bringing in. And I know we're almost at the top of the hour, um, so I just want to skip potentially a few slides ahead here. Um, but once you do have your clients in the door, um, that's awesome. But the next thing is you have to both retain them as well as sustain them. Um, so there's a few things that you can do. So um, I want you to first be focusing on client experience and how you can be making it as easy for your new clients to actually be working with you. Um, so whether that's things like online payments or, you know, value added services in terms of your recommending different technology solutions, different optimizations to the processes. Uh, that's something that you want to be focusing on to make sure that you are actually de delivering value um, to your clients so that they do stay with you long term. Um, beyond that, uh, there's always potential to, you know, upsell and, and further nurture your clients um, to the point where your annual contract value with them is increasing. Um, you're driving more profitability versus just more revenue for from them. Um, so those are really key tools that things like a CRM can help you with in terms of things like email campaigns and uh, automated follow-ups and all those kind of things. And then last, when you do have, you know, your clients in a really good state where they are really happy with your services and um, the experience that they're getting with you, um, you want to be able to activate them so that they are actually bringing business to you because that's really a uh, handy and sustainable marketing channel for you to have as an accountant um, where they're telling their e-commerce friends, hey, I know Joe, he's great. He's helped me done, do X, Y, Z. Um, they're kind of doing the selling for you, which is always super powerful and authentic. Um, so yeah, so those are a few of our tips in terms of how you can really make the most out of your sales process and make the most out of those leads um, that you are bringing in. Um, so yeah, so that's basically what we've got today. Jeff, I see you're back. I think we have one little <laughs> I think the bird heard yeah. you talk about it and uh, <laughs> wiped out my power because the power went out for two seconds. <laughs> oh, no worries. No worries. That's a tough one. Um, Sorry yeah, about that, everyone. No worries. So I think we're good to kind of wrap up here. We have one final kind of slide um, from one of our partners just on the benefits that they found for their practice uh, in terms of using method to automate their sales process. Um, so you can feel free to give that a little read. And if you're interested in using method um, or just checking us out, method.me is our website and they'd be super happy to hear from you. Awesome. Thanks, Elish. So that brings us to the tail end of the webinar. Um, we will be sending the marketing and sales guide via email as a follow-up. Uh, again, a lot of the templates that we talked about throughout uh, this content will be available in the marketing and sales guide. If you have any questions or any additional requests, please do let us know. Uh, we're always happy to create content designed to support our, our partners as they grow because we actually truly view this as a partnership. Um, one of the reasons why we have such a large emphasis on the A2X directory is because we have uh, e-commerce businesses that come to us almost every single day looking for accounting expertise. And we provide technology that helps automate a part of the process, but really a lot of the value that they get is from the folks that help demystify the numbers that help implement the solutions. So we're really, really focused on helping you succeed. So any type of content request, whether it's marketing related or otherwise, please reach out and we're more than happy to, to, to support and put our brain power towards it.